translation, rigid translation. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be here in Natal. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about something a little bit different that is not so well known in statistical mechanics community. Uh, and that is really the systems with long range interactions. And when I talk about long range interactions, I mean non screened long range interactions. So, uh, what I say does not apply to two component plasmas or electrolytes which have a well defined thermodynamic limit um, and for which the normal equilibrium statistical mechanics works really well. Uh, this kind of systems are uh, the ones that I'm going to be discussing here are the really long range gravitational, the real gravitational systems which have infinite range interactions, or say one component in plasmas which are confined by magnetic field. Um, so these systems are kind of pathological in the sense that they do not go to the normal thermodynamic equilibrium that we're accustomed to in for short range systems. Um, so this is the work which was done uh, with people at our institute in Porto Alegre. So Renato Pachter, Filippo Rizzato, so these people work in plasma physics. Tarsisio Teles was a, a PhD student at the time. Fernando Benedja, another PhD student who had finished. Bruno Marcos was uh, a visiting professor for some part of this work. And Anna Carolina was another postdoc in the group. So there is different, I mean, this is a work which was done over many years. So um, lots of people been involved. Uh, so, as I said, the motivation for us is really gravitational system. So let's say you look at the elliptical galaxy and you would like to know, can we predict what's going to be the mass distribution of stars inside the say, elliptical galaxy? Um, and again, because the systems are really long range interactions, well, it's been known since Gibbs that you really have to have a lot of care if you're going to try to apply statistical mechanics to the systems because, of course, there's all kinds of singularities which start appearing in the partition function. But the situation is actually even more subtle because if you try to do the simulations of these systems, you, you really see that they just do not evolve to thermodynamic equilibrium. And I'll show it to you in a little movie in a little bit. So, and similar problem is found, and this is actually was our first motivation to study these things for magnetically confined plasmas. So here you have, let's say you, you have an accelerator and you want to inject electrons or some ions into the accelerator. Uh, so first thing you have to do is you have to confine the ions, so you have like a solenoidal magnetic field which is gonna produce, so as you inject the particles into the, into the tube, uh, the particles start repelling, but there is a magnetic field along this direction, so they just start rotating around the, the magnetic field line. And then you can go in the rotating reference frame, and basically what you can do with a certain approximation, you can map these things basically on the lines of charge uh, confined by a parabolic potential. So here you have lines of charge, so they are really going to be like a lines of charge, so they will have a logarithmic repulsion between them and they're going to be confined inside the magnetic, by the, by the magnetically produced effective parabolic potential. So the system is very simple, so you say, okay, uh, so I will take these particles here, I will distribute them uniformly at the beginning, and then I just do my molecular dynamics, so this is uh, molecular dynamics without any thermostats or anything, so you just conserve the energy, you just solve the equations of motion. So Everything is very straightforward in principle, and if it would be a normal system, this thing would eventually evolve to the equilibrium where you would find the distribution of velocities, Maxwell Boltzmann, for example. Well, in this system, if you wait long enough, you see that the system evolves somewhere, but the somewhere is not in equilibrium, but it has this kind of characteristic core halo structure. So the distribution of particles has a very well-defined core, and then there's a halo of highly energetic particles around this core. And if you look at the velocity distributions, they have nothing to do with the equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. 
micro, you cannot use microcanonical ensemble because microcanonical ensemble presupposes that there is going to be some kind of ergodicity. So you suppose that all the all all the energy surface can be explored by the system, and this is not the case here. So let me just show you. Uh, I'll show you a little movie here so that it becomes clear. So this is for a two-dimensional gravitational system. So we're taking the gravitational system, and just because it's much easier to simulate things in 2D. So we have a gravitational system where particles now attract with a logarithmic potential because it's in 2D. And there is, we don't need any confinement for this particle because it's self-confined, and actually the particle cannot escape from, 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 the, from the core. Uh, because, of course, the energy would have to be infinite in two dimensions, different from three dimensions. So the three-dimensional gravity is really much more complicated. But already we see a lot of what happens, uh, the subtleties of the systems in, with two-dimensional uh, models. So, so here you can see the system. So we started exactly with a uniformly distributed particle distribution, and we're just running molecular dynamics simulation here. So these are particles we just attract by the logarithmic potential, which is analogous to one over our potential in 2D. And you see exactly the same structure developing as was in plasma, which was confined by the magnetic field. So again, you see that there is kind of a formation of this core here, and then you see this halo, which is formed here. And as the system will equilibrate, you, will see, you, you already can see that the oscillations of this envelope here, so we will define this as an envelope of, of the core here, you can see that it's starting to die down. In plasma physics, this is kind of an effect which is known as Landau damping. So you, there is a certain uh, energy dissipation. Huh? So we can we can calculate this. So we can we can write simple equations and actually the the period of oscillations we can calculate. So this is well by what is it defined? Oh, it's basically will be defined by the by the initial energies that you have in in your system. So you, the initial kinetic energy. So there is always kind of a competition between kinetic energy and the initial potential energy. So there is a virial number which is going to be determining the, the amplitude and the frequency of the Well, I can give you exactly what's going to be, but it's going to be changing also. It's not a constant period. So it's, 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 it's oscillates and the period changes. Huh? No, it's going to die down, the oscillations will die down, and then you're going to evolve into... Well, let, let me continue, I think now I can show you some more pictures here. So, uh, so this is the same system, but for 1D one gra one, one gravity. So this is one-dimensional gravity. So we start with now, in one dimension, the gravity, the interaction, the gravitational potential is linear function, the separation between the particles, so just you solve the Laplace equation in 1D. And then what we do is we start with this initial state where the particles are uniformly distributed in this rectangle over the phase space. So this is the position of the particle and this is the velocity. So we distribute uniformly with velocity here and between minus 1 and 1 here. So this is the initial state, and then as the system evolves, it will arrive on this state here. And this is a stationary state. There are no more, all the oscillations have died out. Okay. So when this relaxes, it's going to be in this stationary state here. So there is, again, the score here, and then there is this halo of highly energetic particles around it. Okay. And obviously, it doesn't look anything like, uh, like a distribution that you would expect from the normal equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, even more so if we look at the velocity distribution. So this is a density distribution. So this is our initial state here, this rectangle here. So this is the density distribution. So I'm just looking around zero here and I'm looking what is the density distribution. Uh, so this was our initial density distribution, which was uniform. This is our initial velocity distribution, which is also rectangular. And these points here, 
correspond to the final state. So you see the, the, the system relaxes to, I mean, this is this characteristic perf profile here, and then there's some tail which is, corresponds to these highly energetic particles. And you see the solid curve which goes through all of these points, so this is a result of our series. There are no adjustable parameters here. It, it would be something like, I mean, first of all, you would have an exponentially decaying tails here. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it, it's, it's completely solvable. Yeah. So you can solve things within the microcanonical world. So, uh, anyway, yeah, go. It's, it's going to evolve to a different state. So the state depends on the distribution. Uh, the series that I will present, we're always going to start with this water bag distributions, but it will, the final state will depend basically on the, on the density in the phase space of the initial distribution, okay? Uh, so I, th I think it's going to all become clearer. So uh, to try to understand that, so since we see that the system does not evolve to, to normal equilibrium, then we have to think, well, so how can we study this thing? And of course the approach is to go back to kinetic theory and within the kinetic series, and since uh, we're looking at the long range interactions, what you can show is that if you define a thermodynamic limit, let's say for the gravitational system, we will define the thermodynamic limit in such a way that the number of particles goes to infinity, the mass of each particle goes to zero, but the total mass of the system is fixed. So n goes to infinity, mass of each particle goes to zero, uh, but the total mass is fixed. So this is a well-defined thermodynamic limit for the system. But of course, if you do that, what you really are doing, you are killing all the correlations between the particles because the, the binary interaction between the particles basically will be much smaller than kinetic energy. And then the only thing that will drive the system is going to be the mean field. And then what you can rigorously show is that the distribution function then uh, is going to evolve in accordance with the velocity equation. And this psi then is going to be the mean field potential. Uh, well, the velocity equation is, is very interesting. First of all, because it's really, I mean, in some ways, this is very fascinating because if you're thinking about the velocity equation, it's kind of very similar to Louisville equation. Uh, but in this case, velocity equation for, let's say, three-dimensional system, we only need uh, six parameters. And if it's like two-dimensional systems, then our phase space basically collapses from the full gamma space to the mu space. Uh, so we can actually make some pictures of the phase space, which is really, you can see the evolution, how the phase space evolves for the system. One other interesting thing, of course, of the velocity equation, that there is an infinite number of invariant quantities. Uh, basically, any local function of the distribution function which satisfies this equation is going to be preserved by the evolution. And in particular, of course, Boltzmann entropy is going to be preserved as well. So. Uh, you might say, well, but so how does the entropy evolve in the system? We obviously saw that we started with a regular state and then it went to, the, to something else, this core halo state, and obviously the core halo state is much more disordered than, um, than the initial state. So we can look at the evolution. So this is a different model which is in the field well known as a Hamiltonian mean field model, so it's kind of XY model with, with the kinetic energy for the spins also, and then you can write the dynamical equation, so you can write the Hamilton's equations of motion for the system, and let just look at the phase space. So this is very nice to study. So, so we started with some initial phase space distribution of particles, so this is at t equals zero, and as the time progresses, this region here gets distorted, but of course the loss of equation, you can think about this as being in, in incompressible evolution of the phase space. So you see that this thing is evolves, but the volume of the thing is going to be preserved. And of course, the volume of over the phase space basically is going to be related to the entropy of the system. So we see that as, as the system evolves here, it just gets stretched out. And 
if we have kind of periodic system with a periodic boundary condition, which is in this case for the Hamiltonian spins, our spin variable here is basically our uh, equivalent of the x coordinates. So if there would be periods. So this is x y model. Okay. So basically x y model with infinite range interaction. So every spin interacts with every other spin. But then besides that, you write a kinetic energy term. No, 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 no. Here it's just 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 like x y model. So it's cosine of theta one min minus theta two. And this is just, well, it's an infinite, so everybody interacts with everybody, so, huh? And there is a kinetic energy term which is set a point squared over two. Yeah, yeah, okay. So from this, you can just write Hamilton's equations of motion and you just evolve the system, so it's, it's coupled rotators, but everybody is coupled with everybody else. So this mean field limit, and you have to put one over N, which is a cuts, or you know, scaling to get the correct thermodynamic limit. Um, so the point is that what we can see here is, oops. so what we can see is this stretching and folding of the phase space, but if we look at the volume, it's always preserved. But as the process keeps going, at some point we just reach the limit of the resolution here, and then if we look at this region, of the phase space, which we can then associate with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the entropy, then you would say, well, this region has a bigger volume than this region, but of course this region is full of these holes. So if we would really look with a, with a precise resolution, we would see that there is, um, the volume of this thing is exactly the same as this. Okay? But if we coarse grain, then we see the growth of entropy. So the growth of entropy is really some kind of a coarse graining process. All right, so now we can try to understand a little bit how the system evolves. So let's start with an initial distribution. So I will just schematize it. So this is my phase space here. And so I will start with the initial distribution, which is basically this uh, gray squares here. Uh, and then I will ask, well, how, how will the system evolve? Well, the system will evolve in the following way. Basically, some of this, so I'll, I'll, I'll divide my phase space into this uh, macro cells and micro cells. So this would be macro cells and these are the micro cells. So this is micro, uh, the, the usual construction for, let's say, for the equilibrium statistical mechanics. So that initial distribution that I started will get spread over the phase space. But because, because the Vlasov equation is basically an incompressibility equation, what we see is that we cannot have an overlap of these two squares. So two squares during the dynamic evolution cannot overlap. So this gives us a constraint on the evolution of the distribution function is throughout the evolution, it has to always be less than the initial phase space density. So as the system evolves, so, so we, ha we, we had the initial phase space density, let's say, here, the density in the final state cannot be larger than the density here of the phase space points. Okay, very good. So, uh, so now we can go back to our problems and I will do just go back to this two-dimensional gravitational system uh, because it's, Everything is analogous for 1D gravity, plasma, and whatever. Uh, so the point is what we need to do is we need to solve the Vlasov equation. Uh, and the gravitational potential is going to satisfy the Poisson equation here. And the density is going to be written in terms of the distribution function. So all of these equations have to be solved self-consistently during the dynamics. And in principle, we could try to do that, but the Vlasov equation is extremely unstable. So it's very hard to solve it numerically. It's much easier to do this, the particle simulation and do the molecular dynamics directly. And in any case, our whole objective is to predict the final state without having to solve the Vlasov equation. So the idea is to look at what's going on first uh, how, how, how these halo particles are created. So the idea is the following. So let's try to look 
at a very simplified system. So we saw that there were these huge oscillations. So what I told you is that we can actually calculate the envelope of these oscillations. We can write an approximate equation which will let us calculate this uh, RMS of a position of all the particles within the envelope, and we can write an envelope equation for these oscillations. So we can kind of predict what is going to be the frequency of the oscillations and more or less the amplitude of these oscillations, solving this equation. So this is actually a fairly simple equation. With uncertain approximation, it's very easy to write this. So what we see is, again, depending on the parameters of the system, basically depending on how much velocity we gave the, the initial distribution, but what the ratio basically between the average kinetic energy and the average potential energy within the initial distribution. We have two conditions. If there are, we can, we can end up with a, with a system which has very small oscillations, in which case if I take a test particle and I put it inside this oscillating potential, because there's oscillations are very small, the orbits are going to be completely regular. So what I'm doing is I'm plotting the Poincaré section of the dynamics of the test particle. So each, each, each time the envelope, this thing for which we have an equation, shrinks, I plot a point. So this is just the usual Poincaré plot. Uh, and what we see is that the, that the Poincaré plot, if there is almost no oscillations, the dynamics is completely regular. So we, we make a very simple model for the potential, which just oscillates. So it's a uniform mass distribution. And then the particle, the test particles, feels the oscillations of this distribution. That's it. So uh, if the oscillations are strong, so if, if, if this thing here for the envelope oscillates strongly, we see the formation of the resonance island. So with this very simple model, we can calculate where is going to be the resonance island. So once we know the resonance island, we can calculate what is going to be the maximum energy that a particle can gain from the oscillations. Okay, so this is a basic idea. So this is really is kind of an auxiliary calculation which we do with the help of this thing for which we have a very simple model that we can write so we can calculate where is going to be this resonant island and where is this going to be this potential. So this is a reduced one-dimensional equation, differential equation that we have to solve. Okay, very good. So how does this compare to, to the real n-body simulation? So this is again the simulation of a test particle and we see where the maximum position that a test particle can go to. So here we see that it's about a two and a half. So this is just one particle move inside this oscillating potential, just for, what, for which we have an equation of motion. And here, it's, and here we have the full end-body simulation, which is made out of 6,000 or 10,000 particles, uh, all of which interact by the gravitational potential. And if we compare the maximum position to which particle can escape, it's almost exactly the same as in this. So once we understand this, then we can make a very simple ansatz for the distribution function. So the idea is the following. So we have these oscillations. So the system is oscillating. Some particles of the system then enter in resonance with oscillations of the envelope, and then they can gain a lot of energy. As they gain a lot of energy, they, the energy has to come from somewhere, so it comes from the oscillations of the envelope. So this is a process of Landau dumping which dumps out the oscillations and transfers this collective energy of the oscillations to this halo production. And this is what's happening here. So we see that the particles just kind of evaporate from the core here and they start forming this halo. Uh, but this process cannot go on forever because if it would be a system with short-range interaction, basically you could just keep pumping out the energy out of the core, and the core could collapse. But in this case, we know that the Vlasov equation prevents the core density in the phase space being bigger than the initial density here. So we can make a very simple ansatz. So we say, OK, the particles by parametric resonance excitations escape. They dump on the oscillations until all the free energy of the core is exhausted, which means that the particles which will be left in the core, they have to be 
they have to behave as a degenerate electron gas. So in the degenerate electron gas, we're basically saying that all the energy states up to the Fermi energy are going to be occupied with the maximum allowed phase space density, which is the theta. Okay? And the other particles then will be uniformly distributed between the energy which corresponds to the parametric resonance energy, the one that we calculated using this auxiliary equation and this dynamics of one test particle in the oscillating potential. So we know this number here. So, and the Fermi energy. So we make that such that this, the particles are going to be uniformly distributed over the phase space between the Fermi energy and this. Uh, but we don't know the density. But we also have to have the conservation of the total energy since this is a microcanonical system. So we have to conserve all the energy and we have to conserve the norm. So we can solve all these equations now self-consistently and we get the distribution function. So this is a distribution function for the two-dimensional uh, gravitational system. So this is the density distribution and this is, you see, this is the halo part, this is the core part, and this is a series. So there are no adjustable parameters. We, we do not adjust anything. So everything is, is calculated within the series. And this is a velocity distribution. So of course, if, if it would be Maxwell-Boltzmann, then you wouldn't have this thing and it would be quite different. Uh, uh, so the final thing that, that I, I just want to talk about briefly, and maybe I think it's better if I actually show you a movie. So the interesting thing in this, what I show you up to now is that I said, well, our oscillations cannot be too large. If the oscillations become too large, we can actually have some in very interesting effects where you end up with a symmetry breaking in this system. So this is, again, a two-dimensional gravitational system. And if the ratio between the kinetic energy and the potential energy is close to one, then we end up with a completely symmetric system when, when it relaxes to the score halo structure. But if our at large virial numbers, we end up with a symmetry break, and I'll just finish up showing you a little movie. So, so here again, the two-dimensional gravitational system, but you saw that it was very compact, but we gave it a lot of kinetic energy. So it had a lot of velocity at the initial state. And then the system just kind of explodes because of this initial kinetic energy. And then it starts to collapse on itself. So now this is a, it's a, it's a real two-dimensional projection. And you start seeing that there is a uh, asymmetry break and transition is starting to take place along this axis here. In this case, yes, it's, it's zero. So it spontaneously breaks. So what's, what happens in this case is that you can separate the dynamics, basically. So we do the same thing that we did here to get the, the envelope equations. But now you have to do that for, for each, for x and y separately. And then you see that there's going to be kind of coupling between symmetric and anti-symmetric modes. And the oscillations of the symmetric mode above certain thresholds start driving anti-symmetric modes. And there is, again, parametric resonance in this equation. And this is what happens. And you start seeing the growth of the, of the, of the anti-symmetric mode. And then it just gets saturated by the nonlinear damping effect. Huh? No, there is no rotation. In this case, because there is no, no kinetic, uh, there is no angular momentum. So it just breaks along one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's not a Vlasov. Actually, a Vlasov equation is, is a nightmare to solve. I mean, you can do it for one-dimensional systems, but for two-dimensional, it becomes very complicated. Huh? In this case, uh, I don't remember if it was 10,000 or more, but we did for various systems. So it doesn't depend on the number of particles. So we always check that you're in the thermodynamic limit, of course. <laughs> no. Once it breaks the symmetry, then we don't know anything. So we can predict where it's going to break the symmetry based on this kind of envelope equations. 
So we, we, we can predict where it's going to happen, what virial number you need to have to break the symmetry, but we, we, we don't know how to calculate uh, what is evolved. Oh, no, we, we could do it, but the problem with all of these things, because you see, what, what, what makes our life here simpler is that we have a constant phase space density. So if we have a constant phase space density, then it's much clearer how to write the equation for the, since it becomes like an incompressible fluid. If you have different phase space levels, they all become mixed up. So you, you really don't know how to write the distribution for the core particles already. So if, if, you, if you start with more complicated distribution that is not a water bag with just uniform phase space density, everything becomes much more complicated. So for some systems, let's say for the gravitational systems, we know how to do it if the system starts with the initial state which is close to what we call virial state. So the virial number for the initial distribution is close to one. So, um, then we can, when we, we can use a different theory for that. But if, it's, uh, if the virial number is not equal to 1, then you start having all these parametric resonances, and then you have this processes which with the particle evaporation and the core gets compacted, it becomes very complicated. The beauty of this thing is that it really is like an incompressible fluid. So the core distribution is very simple because it's just degenerate Fermi gas with, with a density like spin degeneracy which is given by the initial phase space density. So this is uh, the simplification. Yes, so, uh, well, okay, so let me just finish this thing and then I'll show you something. So, uh, so l let me just conclude quickly and then I'll, I'll show you another slide there which concerns what you were saying. So again, there is a virial number which is for different dimensions we can just define as this ratio of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So for everything for the gravitational system just depends on this virial number for the initial distribution. So for then what I was saying, there is a symmetric mode and the, there is an anti-symmetric mode and then the symmetric mode uh, drives the oscillations of the anti-symmetric mode if the spherical number is above a certain sh threshold. So in here for two-dimensional system we find these two thresholds and here for three-dimensional we find this. And this seems to agree reasonably well with the simulations. Uh, now coming back to your question here, uh, well, okay, so conclude and then I go back to you. Well, maybe not. So let, let me go back to, to, to your question first. So what we, what we know is that exactly what George per, per, uh, asked uh, is what happens if the system is, has few particles. So in this case, uh, there is going to be a crossover to Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So how does this crossover happen? So we can look at the distribution where we look at the density distribution of the, of in the simulation and compare it with our theoretically predicted distribution and we define this chi parameter. So the system starts somewhere where it's very different. This initial distribution is very different from this core halo distribution which we predict. And then the system very quickly relaxes to the score halo structure. But then if we wait some time, then it starts to cross in over to something else. But as we increase the number of particles, so here we go from 500 to 700 to 1,000, and here is 20,000, then the time that it takes to cross over to the normal Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution starts getting larger and larger. So if we take this dynamical time here and we just rescale it with something that depends on n, which in this case is this thing, then we can collapse all of these curves on one curve, which tells us basically that the time to cross over to the 
Boltzmann statistical mechanics or Boltzmann distribution to the equilibrium scales as n to the 1 to the 1 to 1 1.35. Uh, and of course, an, as the number of particles gets very large, this, this time becomes astronomically big. So, so there is a crossover. So if the system is finite, the correlational effects, although they are very small, uh, they still will eventually drive the system to equilibrium. But in the thermodynamic limit, this is just not going to happen. So, um, so let me just go back and conclude. Uh, so the point is that systems with long range interactions, they lack ergodicity, so they are not ergodic. So you cannot use equilibrium statistical mechanics, at least in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, this proposed core halo ansatz that we did works really well for gravitational systems, spin models, plasmas. So we tested it with many different systems, and it seems to be always working uh, quite well. Um, so there is a significant degree of universality. Um, for this quasi-stationary states, which we find for the gravitational systems, we can actually have symmetry breaking. And the problem is with how to study 3D gravity. And this is a real problem because 3 gravity is very complicated because even with two or three bodies, uh, let's say three particle system, you often find that one particle gains a lot of energy from, from the other two and just, just escapes. So you have constant evaporation of particles, so it's very difficult to study. There's, it's, it's, not, it's unbounded, so. so the particles keep evaporating and it produces a very complicated structure. So we really have no idea how, how to treat 3D gravity in this case. And we don't even know if there is a limit for these things because it's, it seems there is always kind of a gravithermal collapse. So at some point, particles just keep collapsing into it. And the system will just evaporate particles and the core will just get collapsed. Um, anyway, so in here, so there is a review paper So for those who are interested. So there's a lot of the details of what I discussed is in here. Okay.